Test, test, can you hear me? Yes, it's working? OK. <clears throat> so I'm not here to talk about Bitcoin. I'm here to talk about something that um, I noticed from yeah. my time here that a lot of people weren't talking about within the context oh, of Bitcoin, which is physical, physical security, okay. the role of power projection in society, the role of warfare in society, and how technologies, proof of work technologies like Bitcoin could impact that. So real quick, I, I figured I'd do this old school with just chalk. Physical Security 101. We're going to start off in the first 10 minutes of this talking about physical security. I've got a uh, thesis that will be published by MIT, hopefully within the next couple months coming out. And it introduces this concept called, oh, oh was that me? That wasn't me. Thank you. Thank you. What was this? Who's? Oh, did I touch that? Oh, my bad. Sorry. Um, every organism, every organization, every person, every polity or group of organizations can be physically attacked. There is a benefit to attacking anybody or anything. And we can call that benefit the benefit of attack and represent it with this variable. So there's a benefit of attacking a, a hive of bees. It's usually the honey. Honey is delicious. There's a benefit of attacking a boar. Boars are delicious. If you've ever tasted them, they're great. Okay, so everything has a benefit of attack. If you want to keep yourself secure, you're going to have to impose a cost of attacking you. Everything also has a cost of attack. So the cost of attacking a boar is you're going to get gored, or you're going to have to try to not be gored. The cost of attacking a beehive is you're going to get a lot of bees stinging at you. Okay? So nature optimizes itself to figure out how to reduce its, its uh, vulnerability or how to secure itself by imposing a physical cost on on those attackers if you divide the benefit of attacking something by the cost of attacking it you get the what is effectively the return on investment of attacking something which we can call the benefit to cost ratio of attack okay so if you want to be physically secure it is your responsibility to reduce the benefit to cost ratio of attacking you. This is how all physical security works. You'll, like I said before, you'll notice that nature optimizes itself to decrease the benefit of attacking itself, say you're a boar, for example, by growing husks or by becoming physically strong. You'll notice like the top survivors of nature are all mean looking. Have you ever noticed that? Like the, everything at the top of the food chain is, is, it has pointy teeth. Pointy claws, has a, has a lot of muscles hanging from sturdy bones. Nature optimizes itself to impose a physical cost on its attackers in order to reduce its benefit to cost ratio of attack to make itself more physically secure. So if you want to secure any resource, whether it's, let's call it territory, okay, you must figure out how to impose a physical cost on someone who would try to deny your access to that resource. All nature does this, whether it's a single-celled bacteria fighting for space around a nutrient volume of, uh, of you know, volcanic undersea water vents or something like that, to entire nation states fighting for access to some part of the world. Okay? Everything in nature optimizes itself to reduce its benefit-to-cost ratio of attack, or else it will not survive. And what we see around us today are all the things that succeeded at playing this game, this power projection game. It's important to note that they use physical power to do this. Okay? It's not like nature is drafting policy and like writing laws to determine who has what territory. Right? It's not like a lion makes a bargain with like a zebra and says, okay, we're going to have like this, you know, we're going to settle this agreement, this property dispute using nonviolent mechanism. No, 
Everything's derived from power. Uh, the, the permissionlessness, the zero trust nature of nature is derived from the fact that everyone has f free and egalitarian access to project physical power. Okay, so these are all important concepts to keep in the back of our mind because I feel like, especially having gone to school here for two years, this is kind of lost. We're a very civilized society. We, we, if we're successful, we, we never have to actually do the power projection on our own. We can outsource that to people in the uniform, and they can project the power to keep our property secure, keep our domain secure. And so we tend to lose sight of the fact that there's always people paying, playing this power projection game, whether you directly participate in it or not. Okay, so real fast. Why do we have a military? Okay, let's say humans figure out how to irrigate land. They make a nice, freshly irrigated farmland. How do you keep that farmland secure? You do it the same way the bees keep their honey secure. You sting anyone that tries to take that farmland, right? You impose a physical cost or you try to physically constrain them. Let's say civilization starts talking and working with each other across the sea. Well, how do you keep your access to this thoroughfare that we call the sea physically secure? How do you make sure that you have the freedom of access to the sea, that you can transfer goods and services across the sea? I'll give you a hint. It's not with policy. Okay? It's not by drafting bills and shaking hands. If you want freedom of access to the sea, if you want egalitarian, zero-trust access to this thoroughfare called the sea, you hire the Navy. And they will guarantee that you have zero trust and permissionless access to the sea. Why? By optimizing around this, by imposing severe physically prohibitive costs on any belligerent actor who would try to deny your access to the sea. That's why we have a navy. Let's say civilization starts operating through the air. We figure out how to fly. We want to transfer goods and services to each other across the air. Well, how do you preserve zero trust and permissionless and egalitarian access to the air? You hire the Air Force, right? You, you get a group of people who specialize in projecting physical power to impose a physically prohibitive cost or to physically constrain any belligerent actors who would try to deny your access to this thoroughfare that we call the air. And that's why you have an Air Force, okay? What happens when civilization expands into space, into orbit, and they want to start to exchange goods across orbit? They want to use that as a thoroughfare. How do you preserve zero trust, permissionless, egalitarian access to this thoroughfare called space? I'll give you a hint. It's not by writing policy. It's not by shaking hands and signing pieces of paper. You do it by creating a space force. Me, Jackie Tory, we're all in the space force here. Our business is not, this ain't NASA, okay? Right? The business is imposing a physically prohibitive cost or trying to physically constrain any belligerent actor who would deny our access to orbit. That's how you ensure zero trust, permissionless access to any resource. Okay? You optimize yourself to be physically powerful. And then suddenly, as an emergent property, you'll find that you have zero trust and permissionless access to whatever resource you want, whether it be the meat, whether it be the territory, whether it be access to a thoroughfare, whether it be control over something. If you want zero trust, permissionless, egalitarian access to something, you must project power. You must lower your benefit to cost ratio of attack. You must increase your cost of attack, which you, means you must figure out some clever way to physically constrain any belligerent access. You would try to deny your access to that resource. This is how the world works. This is how civilization works. Okay? You, can in, you can verify this independently through your own empirical observations. You can read 5,000 years of written testimony. This is how it works. I don't know what to tell you. All right, now let me pose this question. What happens if civilization expands its footprint into cyberspace? What happens if civilization creates a new vital resource called data or this other resource called control over data. And they start figuring out how to exchange their goods and services with each other in, from, and through cyberspace. How do you secure your access to this new thoroughfare called cyberspace? How do you secure zero trust, permissionless, egalitarian 
access to this domain called cyberspace? How do you secure your data? How do you prevent people from attacking you or exploiting you through this domain? Think about it for a second. Okay, how do we do this in every other domain? How does civilization do this in every other domain? Right? Is it reasonable, just think from first principles, is it reasonable to believe that for some reason, cyberspace would be some exception to this 10,000-year-old trend of human civilization securing itself in every domain by figuring out how to project power in, from, and through each domain to impose physically prohibitive costs or to physically constrain belligerent actors? It's a lot of words. Okay? So, you know, I feel like Magatu from Zoolander sometimes when I'm looking at all these computer scientists, no offense, guys. These are some Space Force coders over here. And they're acting like there is some special combination of if, then, and else statements that they can encode into Python that will secure them from attack or exploitation, that will secure their data, that will secure control over the data, that will prevent belligerent actors from denying their access to this new domain called cyberspace. These coders are sitting here acting like through policy, by encoding policy into Python, they will be able to secure themselves. And then we get into these huge executive orders on improving the cybersecurity in space. We get into the cybersecurity epidemic right now, and people can't figure out how are we going to keep ourselves secure. We see people like raging and being mad because their data is being exploited or someone's in control of some new AI or their speech is being limited or they're being kicked off of a certain network where they can pass information back and forth to each other to include entire nations. Right? SWIFT is just a computer network passing information back and forth to each other. And for some reason, people just expect, I guess, because for the last 80 years, we haven't had the option of projecting physical power in, from, and through cyberspace. People just expect that they will be able to secure themselves using nothing but logic. I would argue that it's only a matter of time until civilization learns how to project power in and from and through cyberspace. And they're going to use this power projection technology to impose physically prohibitive costs on people who would try to deny their access to that domain, who would try to exploit them through that domain, who would try to do all kinds of belligerent activity. Okay? It's only a matter of time until someone's going to come up with a clever way to impose physical costs and to project physical power in, from, and through cyberspace. The question is, what would it look like? It's like not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. The question is, what it would look like, and if it were invented, would we recognize it? If we've never seen this type of power projection technology, if most people in civilization outsource power projection to someone else, the people in uniform that represent less than 2% of the entire population, Okay, would they recognize it or would they think it's just a peer-to-peer -peer internet cache system? And so that was the question that just nagged at me during my tenure here, is I think Bitcoin is much, much more than just bits of coin. I think it's bit power. I think that civilization has finally figured out how to project power in and from and through cyberspace to secure themselves, and they did it using a deceptively simple mechanism by simply converting power to bits. So let's talk through that. What would something like that look like? I'm not saying it is Bitcoin, but I don't see how it couldn't be. Like, it's just a theory. I'm counting on y'all to check my logic on this. So if you need to impose, did I do that again? I did it again. Yep, okay, I totally meant to do that. That was totally intentional. All right. So if you need to uh, project power, if you need to physically constrain someone in this new domain of, of cyberspace, it's a little tricky. Like the other domains are helpful because every other domain has like mass. So if you want to project power, you just like apply a force to displace a mass, and voila, you, you've blocked someone or imposed a physical constraint on someone. They can't get to your resource. How do you do it through cyberspace? Cyberspace is this weird like abstract domain where it's just bits of information passing through this like ethereal plane. Okay, well one way to do it would be to simply 
identify some type of power source out there, let's say the power grid, and then you just build a converter that draws power in watts out of this power grid and on the other side converts it to bits. From a computer science perspective, this is actually really trivial. You can convert basically any physical phenomenon into bits of information. That's how computing works. So we're two miles away from Harvard Mark I, which is was like the first general per electric kind of computer. And the way it works is you just have transistors and you know, one, when a switch is this way, we call it one, and when a switch is this way, we call it zero. We're, so we just literally just apply Boolean logic to physical state changes in a transistor. And so when the Harvard, I'm going to start over here. Actually, I'll start here. When the Harvard Mark One was created, all we did was figure out how to apply Boolean logic to transistor state changes. And from that point, for the last 80 years, engineers have been trying to optimize it so that you create, like, what is the cheapest and most energy efficient state change that you can create? So energy efficiency has been the name of the game. Okay? And if you go around today, you have microprocessors, you have, like, barely any little electrons passing from one side of a floating gate transistor to another side. Or you have like photonic state changes where you're just applying Boolean logic to like phase, amplitude, wavelength changes in my, like just tiny levels of light. Okay, the point being that people have been just assuming that the best way to build and design a computer is to make it more energy efficient. And we've just been marching down this path of making cheaper and cheaper and cheaper to produce bits of information, right? But if we are aiming to, up here, if we're aiming to increase the cost of attacking us through cyberspace, then we're going to have to, we're going to have to march this way. Instead of endeavoring to build the most energy efficient state changing mechanisms for our computers, we're going to have to endeavor to build the most energy expensive, okay? Why? Because physical expense is the name of the game. The whole point is to impose a physically prohibitive cost on the transfer of bits or the control over bits. Okay, why are we doing this? Because in every domain, that's how physical security works. In every domain that goods and services are passed in from through these thoroughfares, the, the only surviving way of securing those things is by imposing physical constraints, by imposing physically prohibitive costs. So we're going to have to create a physically expensive computational system where it's actually difficult to transfer bits or it's difficult to have control over those bits. All for the sake of reducing the benefit to cost ratio of attacking or exploiting those bits. It's actually pretty simple. Von Neumann, the guy who invented general purpose computing, he, um, he actually describes this in his, in his paper. He's like, you know, at the time you had these state changing uh, mechanisms here, okay, these state machines, which we now call computers. And then you apply Boolean logic to that, okay? These days we have assembly language and general purpose language on the tech stack. But he said, if you want to like keep this secure or you want to constrain this tech stack, you got two options. You can encode logic into the, into the machine language or into the assembly language or into the general purpose language. That's what we try to do right now to keep our stuff secure. We try to find some magical combination of if-then-else statements to keep our stuff secure. Or you can just physically constrain the computer itself, the underlying state mechanism itself. Right? Physical constraints. Okay. So let's just assume for the sake of argument that this, is, this theory is correct. 
that one of the key missing ingredients for cybersecurity is the ability to physically constrain other people, computer information, and control over information in, from, and through cyberspace. We need a physical constraint protocol. We need a way for civilization to impose severe physical costs on belligerent actors because no amount of logic is going to protect you against the systemic exploitation of logic. It doesn't make sense. The question is, okay, what should that protocol look like? How should it work? Who's going to use it? How would we recognize if it, if it even is invented? So if you zoom back and you take all this in, in, into mind, you'll note that I think Bitcoin actually qualifies. I think this is what we're actually starting to see. I have a couple more minutes, so I want to make a couple points. We talk about the importance of decentralization. Okay. The question is, how do you achieve decentralization and what specifically are you trying to decentralize? I think one of the key important points of decentralization is control. I mean, that's what you want to decentralize. You want to decentralize control over this protocol. You want to decentralize the ability to pass bits of information back and forth. Bitcoin is showing us that you can do that. You are decentralizing the special administrative privileges of writing the ledger. Why is, why is that decentralized? Well, let's zoom back. Let's go back to this, these other domains. If you were to look at the Earth from space, you would notice that this is going to look terrible, but I'm going to give it a try. Like, that's kind of America, and then this, like, part comes down here, and then there's, like, Europe, and, like, okay. All right? You'll notice that Earth has this, like, dry land, this dry surface area, okay? How do humans determine who gets to control that dry land? Who, how do human polities determine control authority over this dry land? You'll note when you're, like, flying around that the, the world is not neatly partitioned into, like, you know, with, like, these borders that, like, define exactly, you know, who gets control over whatever, right? It just looks like one big thing. But for some reason, human control over this dry land is decentralized. Why? I would argue that the reason why the control authority over Earth's dry land is decentralized is because humans have made it a habit to engage in a global scale physical power competition with each other over that control, also known as warfare. Okay. So the complex emergent benefit of warfare is decentralization of control over Earth's natural resources. We have decentralized control over dry land because we all have armies competing for control over dry land. And as a complex emergent property of that, no polity has ever been able to gain centralized control over all of the Earth's dry land. You'll notice that we're not one government. You'll notice that any time any empire tries to become the one government, they have a lot of people start to fight them off, okay? As a complex, emergent, second, third order benefit of warfare, of a global scale physical power competition, we get decentralization over resources. It's the same for dry land. It's the same for access and control over the sea. It's the same for access and control over airspace. It's the same for access and control over space space. Why wouldn't we expect it to be the same for access and control over cyberspace. What reason can anyone tell me why we wouldn't need to engage in a global scale physical power competition for control over cyberspace, for control over our information, for control over, for the ability to pass information back and forth? Okay? So just keep that in mind. Because, you know, obviously warfare has a lot of negative con you know, connotations with it, but there are, as much as people hate to admit it, and I talk about this a lot in the thesis, there are benefits of warfare. The benefit of warfare is decentralization over the control over resources. The benefit of warfare is any time an oppressive ruling class gets too oppressive, they get overthrown. The United States is a living testament to that. Okay, there is benefit of projecting physical power and imposing physical costs on each other. And if you figured out how to do this in cyberspace where there is no mass, then what you have effectively done is created a non-lethal form of warfare, a form of warfare that cannot cause fratricide. That is a good thing. So when I say Bitcoin is soft war, that's a good thing. We figured out how to decentralize control of our precious resources 
using the same function of warfare, but without having to cause fratricide. That is something to celebrate, in my opinion, not something to get all, you know, angry about. So I wanted to leave that with you. Just keep that in your mind. How much time do I got? Okay. What did I miss? There's a couple of things. Is there anything that I missed? So let's say, I, I know what I want to say. Let's say people invented a power projection protocol, a software protocol where they can compete for control over their data. Right? Let's say we finally get to a point where after 80 years of playing around this way, we learn that we're systemically insecure. And if we want to actually secure ourselves, we're going to have to figure out a way to make physically expensive computer. One way that you could do it is convert the entire global power grid into a state machine. Okay? You apply Boolean logic if, to those state changes. So you create a deficit of large amounts of physical power, and in exchange for filling that deficit, you convert or create a bit of information. That's precisely what Bitcoin does. Okay? It draws power out of, the, out of this global state mechanism. It converts it to bits. It sends it into the existing version of cyberspace. What you do with those bits, that's up to you. Okay? How, bits of information can represent any kind of information to include, but obviously not limited to, financial bits of information. So if you want to call those bits financial information and name this protocol after your first widely adopted use case, then sure, yeah, call it Bitcoin. Right? Coin. But we have to remember that like, these words are just arbitrary. Okay? That th those bits of information that store your cat pictures and your emails, we call it a cloud. Right? With that, that infrastructure that we, we call it a cloud, but it's not really a cloud. That's just how software people chose to describe the thing. Okay? So yeah, we can call this system Bitcoin because we are using our super secure bits as financial information as its first use case, but that doesn't limit this system to only being used for financial information. We, we have to think bigger picture. When, when ARPANET, when TCP IP was first created, it was for ARPA, Advanced Research Agency, now known as Defense Advanced Research Agency, okay? It was called ARPANET because the only information passing across TCP at the time was Advanced Research Agency information, okay? We had to like learn, oh, okay, well, actually, once you figure out how to transfer bits of information across cyberspace, that's actually useful for all kinds of bits of information. So we sh probably shouldn't just call it ARPANET. We should just call it a generic term like internet. And back in the 70s, if you tried to explain this to people, they, they might have been like, ugh, weird. Like, who is this guy? So here I am in this awkward position of being the guy that, you know, has to talk to people who and tell them like, hey, like we could have very well invented a new base layer of architecture of the internet here. Where everyone else was trying to build towards energy efficiency, we, the Bitcoiners, marched in the opposite direction and deliberately produced an energy intensive state mechanism for the purpose of security, for the purpose of increasing the cost of attacking you and exploiting you, for the purpose of imposing physical constraints, because that's the only way to do it, okay? We converted large sums of real-world physical power to bits so we can project power in, from, and through cyberspace. I would argue that the more technically correct term for this protocol would be bit power because we're literally just converting power to bits, right? pulling watts out of the environment and digitizing it and then passing that information across cyberspace. Okay. And it just so happens to be the case that a first really good use case of bit power, of power converted to bits or physically expensive bits of information, i.e. very secure bits of information, it just so happens to be that a first obvious use case of this is for financial information. Okay, and so for whatever reason, we've adopted the habit of calling it Bitcoin, just like we first called the internet ARPANET, just like all these other reasons. So just Try to keep that in your mind here because I think that Bitcoin is uh, grossly undervalued if this is correct. Okay? If it is true that society has just figured out a way to project power in from through cyberspace to secure our data and our control over our data in this new domain, 
if this is the architecture to do it, and if it's being widely adopted across the globe to include entire nation states are now using this, then this is, way, this is a way bigger deal than just Bitcoin. This is a way bigger deal than just peer-to-peer -peer internet cash. This could transform how human civilization organize and train and equip and do business. Okay, it's, it can, this could revolutionize the, the theory of warfare, right, this theory of bunch of people imposing physical constraints on other people in multiple domains to secure themselves and the resources they value, okay? We may be transcending this e concept of a nation state in the first place, because the thing about cyberspace, it doesn't care about like geographical boundaries. What I see is I see a bunch of people standing up, choosing to run this system, choosing to physically constrain people who are trying to exploit them through cyberspace. Okay, I, I see something that is a much bigger deal than just coin. That being said, obviously, if you create the most secure thing, if you create a completely new foundational architecture of the internet, which allows people to actually physically constrain each other to keep themselves secure, obviously a first great use case for that is to protect your, your financial information. Okay, but it wouldn't just be limited to that. And I think we're starting to see it with, with what you see with Noster, with what you see with these other, uh, all the work that we're doing on Lightning and stuff, like we're going to see this protocol used for far more than just financial use cases and we have to prepare for it and, and as the National Defense Fellow, my job is to basically tell the higher ups, hey, like this is important. And the last thing I'll say, I'm almost out of time. This is the part where I have to remind, this is the good part, because I have to remind you that Everything I'm saying here is my personal views and does not reflect the position of the Department of the Air Force or the <laughs> Department of Defense. Okay, so just for the record, right? Um, how do I say this carefully? <laughs> I'll just say this. Uh, Bitcoin didn't cause a bunch of bankers to do fractional reserve lending. I think we can all agree about that, right? Bitcoin didn't cause a bunch of bankers to take too much leverage. Bitcoin didn't cause bankers to debase savers and to destroy the purchasing power of the currency to bail out the bankers who are fractionally reserve lending and taking too much leverage. Okay? Bitcoin didn't kick entire sovereign nations off of an international payment system. Okay, so. We have to keep that in mind, right? If you're an architect of a financial system, then it's your responsibility to not motivate people to leave that financial system, which means don't debase them. Don't continue bailing out the people who are making the mistakes. Don't kick entire sovereign nations off this thing. Like, it's your responsibility to not do that if you want to be, maintain like the dominant financial information network. Okay, don't blame Bitcoin for your, ooh, I almost said something bad. Don't. Uh, I'll just leave it at that, okay? <laughs> so, and, and by the way, if, um, if this is more than just a coin, right? If this is bit power, if we have no kidding, again, this is theory, I could be crazy, I'm relying on other people to evaluate, that's how computer science works, computer theory works. If we have no kidding, figured out a way to project power in from through cyberspace, a new physical power projection protocol, that will transform cybersecurity and national security, then blaming Bitcoin to protect your failing hegemony, let's call it for what it is, okay, that's not gonna help you. It's still gonna break down. Like your financial system is still gonna collapse as long as you keep on doing the things that I just said, okay? What you would actually be doing is you would be forfeiting our access as a nation to this protocol, to bit power. Okay? You would be denying us access to this future. And that would be a strategic nightmare. That would be worse than China burning their merchant naval fleet because it threatened the existing power class, in my opinion. That's if this is true. Again, could be crazy. And again, this is only my personal views. These are what I recommend based off my research. But it's like, let's not forfeit the, king, the keys to the kingdom Right? Let's not try to use Bitcoin as the scapegoat to our 
collapsing system, if it is collapsing, not saying it is, right? Let's think about this strategically and set this nation up for success in the future. This could be a much bigger deal than coin. And I'll leave it there. Okay, thank, you. thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. I, I think this was uh, this was amazing. It's uh, uh, I still I'm kind of still Star Trek uh, starstruck <laughs> when Jason came for the first time in uh, meet, uh, our uh, MIT Bitcoin Club. Uh, I think we had a one-hour meeting and uh, we were there for three hours because we had so many questions. So we have time for maybe a couple of questions. Uh, do you, you want to go? Yeah. You go first. Um, that was interesting. Um, I have some issues with your facts, so it uh, doesn't really weaken your case. Um, I think you, um, I'm sorry, I have some trouble with your facts. I think you ignored most of evolution, which you say, however, maybe it works for human populations. Certainly Satoshi had the energy expense as a benefit. So um, I agree with your basic idea. Um, my friends at the State Department would probably have issues with you saying diplomacy has little value. I understand that's your opinion. Um, the Harvard Mark I had no transistors. It was uh, two and a half tons of relays and rotating shafts, none of which weakens your argument. It'd just be good to have your, you know, your, um, your introduction stronger. Um, I think data are the new chattel, and I think this is really interesting for that. Um, I'd like to just observe that if you have a thousand um, immersive metaverse users, so in cyberspace, the total power for CGI quality immersive metaverse, a thousand users is equal to 10 gigawatts all Bitcoin mining, just a thousand users. I don't know how to fix that. Um, I guess my question is, if I can mine for you know, 10% less cost, 20%, 90% less cost, do I win? Um, let's say you're trying to protect a resource. You're trying to reduce the benefit to cost ratio of attack, okay? You need, you need that power to impose the cost. The cost that you're imposing is the wattage, okay? So if you start marching down this path of trying to figure out how can we create a more efficient proof of work, then you're actually defeating the purpose of the protocol because the entire purpose of the protocol is to impose more physically prohibitive costs, more wattage, right? The, the, that, that wattage is coupled to the special administrative privileges over the, over the protocol, in this case, the ability to write the block is coupled to your ability to solve the hashing algorithm, so to go th overcome that steep physical cost that you would have to overcome. So wattage is good. The energy usage is actually the primary value delivered function. Remember, we're reverse optimizing now. Instead of being an energy efficient state mechanism, you want to create the most energy expensive state mechanism. So the more wattage that proof of work uses, the better and more valuable it is as a physically constraining mechanism, right? As a, as a way to impose severe physically prohibitive costs. So like th this is my beef with like all these, and I know there's some uh, clearly in the audience, is like if, you th if you're trying to go down this path of making a more efficient consensus mechanism, or a more efficient proof of work or switching to proof of stake, then in my opinion, you're, you don't understand the point, right? You don't understand physical security 101. That's why I started it this way, is we just have to recall that, okay? Like, does that make sense? Like if... Yeah, I'm talking about what if I make a tank as strong as anyone, but I just can make it cheaper. Okay, yeah, so yeah. It, um, that might be good, so you get uh, better hash rates, right? That, that's definitely helpful. Um, sure, I mean, I can see kind of parallels to that with Bitcoin too, but you'll notice that like, the way Bitcoin is designed is it doesn't matter how efficient your hashing system is, you're always chasing a fleeting horizon. That's why they have the difficulty adjustment. No matter how efficient you make your tank, no matter how efficient you make your mining mechanism, the protocol is just going to make it harder and make it harder and make it harder. And so there's this debate, like, in the future, as our ASICs get super efficient, is Bitcoin as a whole going to be more efficient? Are we going to actually use less power? I would argue probably not, because the protocol is literally designed to make to increase the difficulty ad infinitum. So no amount of hashing efficiencies is going to get you there. 
but that's still up to debate. This is still early theory, right? All right, uh, we are out of time, so one, one last question quickly. Sure. Quickly, um, if this unfolds the way you're describing it, um, for nation states, what, what's the role of the, the civilian for the people? Should they have this or should it be accumulated by the nation state? Um, so I, yeah, this is why if you've seen me online, I very much advocate for the Second Amendment protection of Bitcoin because uh, people, ha at least in America, have a right to physically defend the things they value, the resources they value. If I choose to call these bits my money or my property, okay, and I have created this or been, I'm participating in this network that allows me to physically constrain anyone who tries to deny my access to that resources, I believe that is a very solid, there's a very solid constitutional right to do that. Okay, if, if, some, if I'm allowed to shoot someone who comes into my house and tries to take stuff, then I should be allowed to to spend watts to protect someone from 51% attacking my information or trying to exploit my information. So the, the, the function of applying physical constraints to protect or secure your resources has changed. It's no longer force displacing masses as the exclusive way to physically defend your property. We have now clearly demonstrated a way you can do this electronically. Charges passing across resistors, still using watts. Okay, still imposing a physical cost and physical constraining anyone who tries to exploit you or take advantage of your property or steal your property, right? But we're doing it in a non-lethal means. So, of course, people, individual citizens, at least in this country, ought to have the right to do that. Uh, why would we expect that to be an exception? Um, but then the question, uh, the, the real, like, interesting idea is, like, well, what happens when, like, entire nation states starts doing this, too? And we don't need to like theorize about that. It's actually happening. You have El Salvador's out there declaring Bitcoin as their sovereign law and using hashing to defend it. So these are questions that we need to start like addressing real fast because it's moving much quicker than I think a lot of people at the higher places are, are tracking. I know that's time. All right, uh, thank you so much. Uh, let's uh, give another thanks to Jason. And, uh, yeah, and, and thank you for being the voice of uh, the Bitcoin community and government. You really need that. Thank you. <laughs>